saving for a rainy day, but it's not even wet. Then there's food, some gas, and clothes. Don't forget the rent. Insurance pops up here and there. And don't forget to cut your hair. You need new shoes, but you got the blues because you just ran out of cash. Welcome to Sensible Chat, the podcast committed to helping you learn positive money mindsets, destroy debt, reduce financial stress, and break the paycheck to paycheck cycle. Our guest professor today is Myra Oliver, author of Down Home Money. She's going to share her simple approach to financial freedom and what she learned on her journey. After class, Sensible Bobby will walk you through some things to think about as you prepare your budget for the new year. So, without further ado, let's get to the saint of the sawbuck, the competent custodian of cash, the boss of budgeting. Here is Sensible Bobby. Thanks, Scott, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Sensible Chat. I want to get right to our guest today because I know the idea of financial freedom has been top of mind for a lot of people this year. For some, it seems unattainable given all the challenges they've faced. For others, those challenges have really driven home the burning desire to achieve financial freedom because of how quickly our lives can change and how much we tend to take for granted, like our paychecks. I hope my interview with Myra Oliver will really solidify the fact that no matter what your situation looks like today, you have the power to achieve financial freedom. And I hope you'll take the first step with us today. Put down the iPhones and grab some wood because Sensible University is now in session. Today's guest professor is Myra Oliver, financial freedom coach and author of Down Home Money. Myra is a Kentucky girl who started her career as a hairstylist, then became a real estate broker, investor, and entrepreneur. But her favorite job is the one she does now, helping people see their money differently and how it can provide a life worth living and financial freedom. Myra, thanks so much for being our guest professor today. Oh, thank you so much, Bobby, for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you. Tell me a little bit about your background and what led you to write this book. You know, well, my background, there's a variety of things. I started out in the hair business. I owned a hair salon in Dallas, Texas. I bought that hair salon when I was 20 years old. So I started as an entrepreneur at a young age. And then I got into the real estate business as a real estate broker. And then now I'm a franchise owner of three Keller Williams franchises. And that just all happened kind of by accident. It really didn't happen purposeful. I was seeking financial freedom in my 20s. And by the time I reached 33, my husband and I were both able to quit our jobs. And we became, you know, just freedom of time and financially free. And we traveled and did all these things. And we had bought real estate to provide us with a passive income. And with that, I watched a lot of real estate agents selling me real estate. And I thought, gosh, I think I could do that. And I think I would enjoy it. So I stumbled on getting my real estate license just for my husband and I to you know, purchase real estate. And one thing led to another. So that's how we ended up where we are today. Wow. What an amazing story. And at 33, you were yeah. able to stop working and do the things you really wanted to do. Man, it's such a great story and something that we'd all love to accomplish. But we may not realize what you had to do in order to get there. I mean, everybody kind of has this, I wish, I wish. But how do we transition into the mentality of I will instead of I wish so that we can get the things we're really going after? Oh, wow. That's a great question. And truthfully, that is the difference in making it happen or not. You have to decide. There is a lot to this and mindset is 90% of it. I have friends that work out a lot and are bodybuilders and they say that diet is 90% of it. Well, for financial freedom, mindset and being okay with delayed gratification is 90% yeah. of it. Yeah, it's all about the mental state of mind. I think it's a beauty and a curse, you know, because it's achievable for all of us, but it takes all of us to do it. And we kind of want some outside force to do it for us, which isn't right. going to happen. So yeah. now here's a line from your book that really struck me because I think a ton of kids have felt this way. Quote, they both worked two jobs to make sure my brother, sister and I had everything we wanted. What we really wanted, however, was to spend time with them, end quote. And this happens so often because our lives are out of balance so often. So how can we use money to help with that balance instead of being a slave to it? 
You know, I was raised in Kentucky and both my mom and dad were school teachers. And then at night we would get out of school and my mom would make sure we, you know, ate dinner. And then my mom and dad would leave for their other job, which they did the Amway business. And they were gone every night of the week building an Amway business. And, you know, especially as I've gotten older, I just really realized what we really wanted was I wanted them to be at those ball games when I was cheerleading. My brother wanted them to be at his football games when he was playing football, but they felt like we wanted stuff and we really didn't. We had everything that we needed. So it really was they were sacrificing time for things that they thought we wanted when actually time is so limited and time is so finite and money is infinite. You can always make more money, but time you're very limited and, you know, you're very limited with your children, how much time you have with them. And so that's what really made me realize that, you know, if my mom and dad would have stopped the consumerism. Because honestly, all we wanted was them and to be with them and spend time with them. If they would have quit worrying about buying us more stuff, so to speak, I didn't need designer jeans. And my brother didn't need a new truck when he turned 16. We needed them. Now, sure, I'm sure as kids, we probably were thinking that, you know, wow, this is great. But at what cost? So I really feel like that if we get control of our spending, I find that it truly is not how much money you make. It's how much money you keep and what you do with it. And I do coaching with some of my real estate agents in my office. So I offer that as a part of our package, our value package. And so it's very interesting listening to people because they really are caught up in the new car, the bigger house, the designer clothes. When, you know, in all reality, you and I both know that it really doesn't matter. That stuff doesn't matter. You know, at the end of the day, when you really look at what gives you joy and purpose and happiness, it's not stuff. It's the people and the time you spend with the people that you love. Isn't that so true? And it seems like we all figure that out eventually. But man, it takes some of us a really long time. And it's sad all the time that goes by in between. And the weird part is, is that it it seems like it has so much to do with this whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. You know, because we Mm -hmm. it's, it's like we're all chasing something that somebody else told us we should want. And maybe we do in the moment, you know, because it looks good when somebody else else has it. The grass is always greener. But yeah, like you said, I mean, if we could all just kind of pull back and think about the life that we want, forget about what everybody else wants, what everybody tells us is best, you know, what do we want and really focus in on that. That would be such a great thing. But going back to what you were saying a minute ago about time being finite, and in the book you were saying that you spent a lot of time just working instead of pursuing your passion. And I remember hearing people say this when I was broke and swimming in debt, and it really made me angry because... I hated trading all my time for work, but I didn't feel like I had any kind of choice because I felt like I was trapped by a lack of money. It wasn't, I should be doing this when I'm focused on the wrong thing. It was like, no, I don't have a choice. I have to do this. I'm trapped. So I always had this, you don't understand attitude about it. And I felt (laughs) completely powerless. And I think a lot of people feel that way or have felt that way. So how would you respond to that as a difference between somebody who's just deciding on a different mindset and somebody who feels like that's not even attainable? Yeah, you know, I think that you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Choose wisely. I think that you've got to feed your brain. You've got to feed your mind. You've got to feed your soul. And when you do that with positive feedback, because let's just face it, life's negative, okay? I mean, things are coming at you at all times because you're really, we're not in control. We think we're in control, (laughs) but let's face it, we're not in control. And things are happening. You know, you pull out of your driveway. I mean, I hit my mailbox the other day, okay? And so, I mean, things happen, right? And, you know, you're not in control. And I think that I could have gotten mad. I just laughed. I mean, I really did. My husband didn't laugh. Uh, But I just kind of laugh because I don't take things so serious anymore because I really do a lot of affirmations and a lot of positive feedback. I have to work on me, Bobby. What I learned is, is that it's really easy to point fingers and it's really easy to be a victim of your circumstances. Mm -hmm. But let's just face it. We make decisions every day that affect the trajectory of our life. 
And if you're making bad decisions, that's on you. I mean, I had a really good friend when I was young, and and this was part of my debt problem, is she loved to shop. And so that was kind of our thing that we like to do together. We go shopping, right? And and we weren't buying cheap stuff. She had that champagne taste, but I had a beer pocketbook. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And she just loved to spend money. And I found that I was getting in that trap with her. And I had to reevaluate. And sometimes you have to let people go in your life that are not good influences, whether I mean, and I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about it could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be bad relationships. It could be whatever. Right. And sometimes um, you have to let people go that cause you to do things that aren't, you know, for your best life, to live your best life. And so I think that that is really important. And, And I do surround myself with people that encouraged me, who helped me be the best version of myself. And with that said, I think that it's so important that you see your money differently. You know, we see our money as buying things and buying stuff. Um, And I don't know about you, but I had a lot of stuff. Okay, I had I mean, my closets were packed. I had tags on stuff. I had all of this stuff and I still wasn't happy. Sure. And what I found is, is that it was like a fix. It's kind of like a drug addict, I guess, when they get a fix. I mean, it was like a shopping was like a fix for me. Right. It just made me feel better in that moment. But when I really realized what the problem was and I realized how I could move forward and I just started doing a lot of positive affirmations and I realized that money was my ticket to freedom and money gives you choices. Money does not give you happiness. I know a lot of wealthy people that are just miserable, but they have a lot of stuff. Okay. But they're not happy. And then I know people, and one in particular, a lady that I've been coaching, that she was in $80,000 in debt. And we're getting ready to have a big party for her because she, in two years' time, with making $50,000 a year, she is going to be completely out of debt. Nice. Isn't that fabulous? And that was, we had to do a side hustle. And we've had to do a lot of things because you, you have to be willing to do what others won't in order to get what the others don't have. And she has been committed. I've been committed to her success. And so it's so exciting that she is going to be free. And what she's found and learned over the last two years is that stuff wasn't giving her happiness. And, you know, nowadays when you've got TV shows like the Kardashians, I mean, you and I, (laughs) we just heard about the the Joneses, right? But we didn't have them on our TV every week. I know. You know, showing us everything that they were buying and doing and making us want. And, you know, and I think that we all get caught up in more and more and more. And I think when you finally realize, wow, I've got enough. And now I need to figure out how to get it paid for so that I can work in my passion and work because I want to work, not because I have to work. Yeah, it's definitely about switching your mindset to what financial freedom really means to you, because there are so many people who define it as a bigger paycheck and it's it's not about that. So how do you define financial freedom? You know, financial freedom for me is I want to be able to wake up and I've been able to do this since I was 33 years old and I want to be able to wake up and make choices not based on someone else's goals and dreams. I don't want to chase somebody else's dreams. And I got back on that trap, to be honest with you. So once we retired for, th- we were retired for three years, my husband was with the police department. I sold my hair salon and we were free for three years. We had made it to $5,000 a month passive income through our rental properties. And I got bored and I got back on that hamster wheel yeah. and I started chasing success and money. And um, I started selling real estate. So first I got my license to buy real estate. And then I started selling real estate. And then I became the number one agent in my town. And then the biggest company came and recruited me to run their office. And I did that for three years. And then I ended up owning that office. And then I ended up becoming a regional director for my company. And I went to Kentucky, Ohio and Indiana, putting in franchises. And I doubled their region there. And then I finally woke up. Honestly, I was sitting in a John Maxwell I'm a big follower and I was sitting in one of his seminars and John Maxwell said something that's, I mean, it just slapped me between the eyes. And he said to me, he goes, I say, he said to me, I was sitting on the front row. So it really felt this way. (laughs) But he said, he said, success is great, but significance is where it's at. Wow. 
Yeah. And that day, my whole world changed because I realized I had really been chasing other people's dreams. And I sat down and I wrote what was my passion and what gave me joy and my purpose. And it was really interesting. None of it had anything to do with money. And I was like, why am I? I mean, I was making a lot of money. And I was like, why am I doing this? You know, I have no children and we were financially free already. And I am so frugal. I don't spend much money. I mean, I have a five-year-old car. I, my my whole thing is I don't live in my money. I don't drive my money and I don't wear my money. My money makes money and helps other people. So it was just, you know, it was so weird, Bobby, because that day my whole life changed and I started working towards letting go of that regional job. And then 2018, I resigned and I sat down after I resigned because I was on this, I mean, seriously, it becomes this treadmill and you can't get off. I mean, it's going fast uh, Yeah. and you're just so caught up in it. You can't get off. And that's how I ended up with three franchises. And now, I mean, I'm totally out of the franchises. I am the owner of the franchise, but I have people running them. So they are passive for me. But I really realized that I needed to tell my story. Story because in all honesty, if I'm really honest with you, Bobby, I was just as happy making 5000 a month and building it and my husband and I building that together. And really, we didn't need any more money. So I regret spending that precious time that I'll never get back trying to make you know more money and success because you know money's only good for the good it can do. And I was already doing a lot of good with my money. And yeah, you just, the only reason you need more is if you want more, 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 more. And I didn't. So I couldn't really, I had a struggle of trying to figure out why did I do that? Yeah. So my goal now is to help the people that have worked for me and, and been so great. The first of the year, I've got one of them that I'm giving some ownership to. And so now my goal is a little different. I'm going to help the people that help me. I mean, to reach down and, and help the ones that have been so loyal and helped me. So it's really good. It's, it's back to that significance. Yeah. And it's so exciting to be able to do that because that's such a wealthy feeling. I mean, you know, people talk about wanting to be rich, but I think that rich is about the stuff to me and wealth is about the value of your life. And like you've said, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, but it just it buys you those choices to be able to spend spend the time the way that you want and really value life because the experiences are so much more important than, you know, what you have in your, if, when you're on your deathbed, nobody's going to ask you what kind of car you drove, you know? Right. So right. That's, yeah. There's a great book about that. What is it? Um, the five regrets <laughs> of the dog. And it, it's, it's true. And you're going to regret not spending time with the people that you love because you were so busy working and hustling, yeah. trying to make more money so you could buy more stuff. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's just it's a vicious cycle. And then there's the debt trap, because yeah. the problem is if you've got the money to buy it, that's one thing. Right. But when you don't have the money and you're busy trying to keep up with the Kardashians or the Joneses and you're going in debt in order to have all these this stuff, and wear these clothes and jewelry and whatever it is that you're buying, then you're in trouble. And then, you know, the number one cause of divorce is money. It's money, yeah. That's you know, and so it's just a vicious cycle that I think that once more people understand it, and, you know, back to your question about, you know, advice and how we can get people, if they get their mindset right, you know, living in scarcity when you live in scarcity and the fear of not having enough and always wanting more and and a scarcity mindset, it's really hard for you to see the light at the end of the tunnel and abundance. And yeah. that's why it's so important that if you get your mindset right and you work on why are you doing this? Because you got to know your big why, because there are going to be days. I mean, there were days where I was just mad. I wanted to go to the mall yeah. and I wanted to buy everything on, that I saw, you know? Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Yeah. It happens yeah. The because, best of us. yes, because delayed gratification, you know, this is simple. It's not easy. And delayed gratification is hard because we live in a world that tells you you can have it right now. Just Definitely. put it on the credit card. You can have it. 
Yeah, if you sell your soul, basically, for the next right. God knows how many years. <laughs> yeah, but, right. You know, I think that light at the end of the tunnel that you were talking about, that's so important. That's certainly when it became possible for me. When I mean, I, I actually did the math about my own debt and found, you know, a plan and saw that light at the end of the tunnel. And that's what really set me off because that was the hope that I had been looking for. And there's so many people, I mean, it's seems so overwhelming. You know, when you say, well, I've got this much in debt, I'll never get out of it. And you keep using that. I'll never, I'll never. But, you know, in your book, you talk about this financial freedom number. And I think that could go a long way towards people really getting on board with what they need to do, because sometimes they think it's an insurmountable amount of money, but they don't actually know what it is. So how do they figure out what that number is for them to reach financial freedom? Great question, and that's a great place for them to start. And it depends on them. And here's the wonderful thing is that none of us are trees. We're not planets. So we can move at any point and move numbers and change our spending habits in order to lower that number. So depending on where you are today. So when you one of the first things you need to do is you need to figure out your net worth. You got to know where you are and what you've been working for all these years in order to know where you're going. And that sometimes is a scary number for people when they figure out their assets versus their liabilities and they realize that, guess what? I've been working for 20 years and it's a negative number. That's scary. Mm -hmm. But the only way you can change it, because where you are today is a result of the actions you took five to 10 years ago. And where you're going to be in five to 10 years is a result of the actions you take today. And if we keep not knowing where we are, we're going to continue to be going somewhere that we don't even have a clue where we're going and not even sure if we got enough gas in the car. And so it's so important to know that. And once you know that, you need to do a budget. You need to figure out what you're spending every single month. And how I did this, Bobby, is I write everything down, okay? I'm a very visual person. And so I would have to write stuff down. So I would carry a little notepad with me. And you can do it on your phone. I preferred a notepad because it was the whole thing of taking a pen out and writing it down and reevaluating it for me that made it work for me. And so I would write every penny. I mean, to the tune of if I put a quarter in a gumball machine, I mean, (laughs) I wrote it down. Okay. And then I I did that for three to six months to figure out what is my monthly number that I have to have that is just mandatory for me to live. And once you know that number, now we got a number to shoot for and we can build on that. So we let's say the number is just to make things simple, $3,000 a month. So the freedom, your freedom number is $3,000 a month or $36,000 a year. And so then the next thing is, is that we want to figure out how you can start today and it's going to be slowly. This is slowly, so slowly. And then it's suddenly you go, wow. So for me, it took 20 years. If I just look at my retirement account and investing in index funds, it took 20 years to throw me off 50,000 a year through investing in that. So I did rental property. So my goal was 5,000 a month. So I thought I'm going to be building with index funds, a portfolio, but I know it's going to take time and I'm going to let it compound. Meanwhile, I'm going to buy rental property because I can buy a few rent houses and it took 10 rent houses to throw me off 5,000 a month. And I bought these houses. We managed them ourselves. My husband is really talented with fixing things and repairing things. So he did all the work on them. So we didn't hire out any thing really, unless it was major. And so we saved a lot of money that way. And we built it to where we had 5,000 passive a month. And that took us about 12 to 13 years. But meanwhile, we're building both passive income streams. And that's why it's so important that you invest, even if it's small increments every month, it's the consistent behavior that helps build to get that passive number. And after the 13 years, we were able to go, hey, we can walk away from that 5,000. And then here's the really neat thing about the number. Let's say the house you live in is too expensive. And you need to sell your house so that you can get the number lower so you can retire sooner. At any point, Rick and I could have, when we got to making 3000 a month on the rental properties, we could have changed our spending habits to get down to 3000 a month if we wanted to retire sooner. But our goal was 5000 and we stuck to the plan. 
but you can move the plan. That's up to you. And remember that you go to work every day. If you're going to work to pay for your house, your car, your spending habits, then if you alter those spending habits, you can lower the number and you can work less. And I think that's what it's more about is that you could then go to a job. Maybe your passion is volunteering and that doesn't pay real well. No, but it allows you to work in your passion when you get your spending under control and you build some other passive income streams. And that's what the rental property and, you know, and meanwhile, I was building my income stream through passive dividend investing and index investing. Intentional choices, you know, that's what it seems to all really come down to, intentional choices, because what you want is attainable. You just have to decide what you really want, what you're going to focus on, because whatever you're focusing on, that's what seems to happen. And everything else just kind of goes by the wayside because it's not quite as important, if you will. But were you talking about, you know, investing in real estate property and everything brings up a really good point, because when you go from the mindset of not having enough money to to pay the bills or I'm in debt, I can't get what I want, all of this stuff. And then a lot of people, when I started budgeting and everything, it was like save every penny and pay off all the debt that you can, which was great. And we did that. But then it becomes how much of this do I hold on to to make sure that I have a financial foundation while still putting some, because if you don't find a way to make your money grow for you in investing, like you're talking about, you can kind of get stuck in a place where you're you're not really going to go any farther, right? So right. where is that balance between making sure that you're okay and being frugal with your money and hoarding it too tight so that it won't grow? That is a great question. And I think that a lot of people get caught in that. And it's just like I was looking at my bank statement this morning and saw that, you know, my bank's paying me 0.15%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ridiculous. So I immediately looked at that and I thought, okay, I need to move that money. So, I mean, you've got to always be paying attention. And I love what you said about focus because what you focus on expands. And it's so important that you focus and you stay in tune with what's going on. You know, what's happened to our society is that we bring home a paycheck, especially if you have a job that pays a certain salary, like for my husband. And, you know, it's interesting because my husband's a policeman and you know what? He never made more than about maybe 45000 a year. And I may be being generous, <laughs> maybe forty five with overtime and stuff. But he was limited and teachers are limited, you know, I mean, because they told him what his value was. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And certain jobs pay certain amount of salaries and that's it. And so I always tell people, you know what, if that's the job you choose and that's what you want to do, then you may have to get some side hustles. You may have to go earn more money so that we can have the extra money, because the first thing is we got to build your reserve accounts. Yeah. Our reserves are first, and I'm okay with those being a money market. And you can get the 0.15 because just in case, because that's what they're there for, that you have to have easy access to them. But there's some other different banking. You need to check the rates, and you need to be willing to move money around a little bit just to make more money. But, you know, the stock market has brought in, on average, the last 30 years, about 8%. And um, and that's after inflation. So I think that, you know, you need to learn about index funds. I didn't know anything about them. Bobby it was so interesting. I had a gentleman, I cut his hair and he was really wealthy. And, you know, I'm in my 20s and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, uh, young lady, what are you doing for your retirement? And I started laughing. Right. <laughs> and I just laughed. I said, I'm in my 20s. I don't think I'm not worried about retirement. Right. You know, and he was probably in his late 60s, honestly. And he said, yes, you do. He said, you want a guaranteed retirement? Because there's not going to be any Social Security when you get up there. He said, and you need to be investing in index funds and you ought to open your account with Vanguard. I mean, he shared with me all of that. And I didn't listen for several years. And I cut his hair for like 12 years. And one day Bob said, hey, have you done what I told you? And we stopped and he showed me and he had a prospectus from Vanguard and showed me a little bit about it. And he said, you need to do this and you need to put it in an index fund. And he said, you need to put it in the S&P 500 index fund. And I did that. I never touched it. I started with $100 a month. I mailed a check back then. And then it went automatic withdrawal from my account. And I never touched it. And then I started maxing it out because I was self-employed. And so I did a SEP. It was a SEP plan, Simplified Employee Pension. And he made me a millionaire in 20 years just from that. 
That's um, awesome. without even doing the real estate. And that's why if I can just touch young people today, I have five nieces and nephews and my goal by my book. And when you asked me about my book and my goal was, you know, I, I wanted to write a long time ago. I just never sat down, took the time and, and I'm not a writer. So I really struggled and, and I had great people who coached me and helped me along the way. But my whole goal was if I can change the thinking of my millennial nieces and nephews, then I can help them become millionaires just like Bob helped me. And I mean, it was that one thing that if I hadn't changed anything else I was doing, that one thing would have put me in a really great position later in life. And I mean, you know, if you're 20 years old and if you just do $95 a month, you will have a million dollars by the time you reach retirement age. It's just, it's been proven with compounding. You don't touch it. You just continue to make that investment. And I think that if we can just teach our kids today, they just don't learn it in school. No right. one teaches them about money. No. They teach them that if you want those expensive jeans, it costs money, but they don't. <laughs> yeah, it's very frustrating how none of that is taught in school. And you're right. I mean, it's such a priceless gift that we can give to the next generation that look how easy it can be if you start young. The compounding and the time together is just an amazing thing. And, you know, if for me, it was always, okay, well, you know, time to do that later. And I didn't understand how much the time and the compounding made a difference because now, later on, yes, you can start later, and but it's, it's yes. you have to put more in and right. the compounding does not have as long to go. So it's just the small amounts that you can do early on versus what, what you do later is, is just a, an amazing difference. And it, it really is. And, you know, and it's not that much even when you're in your 40s and 50s. Yeah. You know, it's five, six hundred dollars, okay, a sure. month. But if you get your debt under control, because I guarantee you, yep. you're paying that in debt. <laughs> exactly. And once you get the debt under control and you get that paid off, then you can take that money and invest in yourself. Yeah. And here's the deal I, I think people don't really understand is that this is for your future and you are investing in your future self. And, you know, the thing about it is, is that people don't mind going and using their credit cards. But here's what the one thing that they're not thinking about. I mean, it's so clear to me now, right? It wasn't back when I was using credit cards, but I will tell you that I watch, I use my nieces and nephews because they crack me up because they don't like delayed gratification whatsoever, right, right. that generation. And I love them. They're so smart in so many ways, but they don't because we gave them everything, right? Yeah. Early, we gave it to them. You know, we didn't right. want them to be delayed because we were delayed. And so we don't want them to be delayed. So it's our fault. And so I watch them and I laugh because, you know, they go by, you know, they'll go spend $300 on a new purse. Are you kidding me? I want the $300 in my wallet, not yeah. in my purse. <laughs> and right. so we laugh about it. But I said to one of my nieces, I said, that $300 that you didn't have, it wasn't in your bank account. You didn't. So it's not like, you know, you could just go write a check for it. I said, instead, you use credit. And here's the deal. You just caused yourself to have to continue to work because as long as you keep spending your future income, you're going to keep putting your retirement farther and farther out because you are spending your future income. You're not spending the money you have today. So that purse didn't really cost you $300. It's going to cost you a whole lot more. And you need to understand that. And I think, you know, I'm just learning how to speak their language so I can get to them. Because if I can just help them, their life's going to be so much better, Definitely. Um, you know, in their future as far as retirement. Because all of my family, my brothers and sister both still work. And most of my family in Kentucky were paycheck to paycheck. And I just want to change the trajectory of that next generation. And I know we can do it. And it's just through community communication and, and, you know, and just showing them. I'm a firm believer that documentation beats conversation. Yeah. And so I give them graphs and I'm sure they're like sick of me, but I, <laughs> I just want to help them have a wonderful life. That's all I want to do. I just want to make sure that they're not struggling in their 50s, 60s, 70s, still working a job so that they can pay the rent yeah. and that they can pay that car payment, you know, and not ever really own anything. And it's so, so doable if we just understand 
understand it and put some time and thought into it. It really is doable. Now, when people start to change their mindset, like I know in the beginning, I kind of felt like the world opened up to me with all these options that I'd never realized were there. And it really was doable. You know, you get so excited about it. And we often want to start doing everything at once, which a lot of times leads to burnout. And then we decide to do nothing because it's just like, you know, we we got excited, then we got overwhelmed and it's like, forget it. So how do we focus on the task at hand and not the entire to-do list so that we can climb this mountain one step at a time? Yeah, that's great. Every journey starts small and we don't like that. I mean, in society, we want everything bigger is better, right? Um, so every journey small. And the first thing that I would tell anyone is you got to know where you're at. And when I talk to people, I mean, I work with a lot of real estate agents and they make a lot of money, Bobby. And so, but, you know, if you make a million dollars and you spend a million too, you're still 200,000 behind. Right. You know, and so it doesn't matter how much money you make. It matters how much money you keep and what you're doing with it. So if we figure out where you are and we really do a net worth and figure that out and start writing down where you're spending money, it's going to make you aware. And awareness is key. You'll start seeing your money differently. Honestly, I have that. People say that to me all the time. They're like, you know, now that I had talked with you once a month, because that's what I do. I meet with them once a month. And they're like, now when I talk to you once a month, I know I'm going to talk to you the next month. And I think that's where coaching is so great for accountability, right? Oh, yeah. Because they're like, uh, when I talk to you and I know we're going to go over everything, I realize that I'm just so much more aware. Like used to, I would go through Starbucks and get my $5 coffee and not think a thing about it. Now I'm like, what would Myra do? And I just laugh (laughs) about it. You know, I'm like, Myra would tell you, stay away from Starbucks. Okay. Fix coffee at home. That's what Myra would do. And take that $5 and act like you spent it. That's $25 a week. That's $100 a month. If you're going through every day, we can buy index funds and we can start building that passive income. And, you know, every journey starts with the first step and you got to get started. And I think getting started is the hardest. Honestly, Bobby, when I decided that I wanted financial freedom, when I made that commitment and that decision, it's just like anything you do in life. When you've decided you've committed to getting married, you've committed to having children, you've commit to I'm going to go to college, you're committing all the time. I'm committed. I'm going to retire. Once you make commitments in life and you take them seriously, you will move forward. And what I found is that once people have made the decision and listen, let's just face it, it's a lot easier to keep spending your money and be in debt and then be poor, pitiful me and be a victim. That's way easier. Sure. Okay. And so if you're looking for the easy road there, that's the easy road. But if you're looking that you want a different life and you want to create a different life for your family, a life worth living, a life of passion and joy and purpose, then you are going to have to do the hard stuff right here on the front end. And I will tell you, it gets easier because once you start building your plan and you start saving and let's say this month you save $50. Wow. Wow. That you're fifty dollars ahead of the game than you were the last few years, right? Yeah. If you've been living paycheck to paycheck, and that fifty dollars then becomes a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars becomes a thousand dollars. I think that once you start seeing this journey, and you're seeing that this path you're on is leading somewhere that you weren't going before, and you see the light, yeah. it becomes a game. I mean, still to this day. I love saving money. Girl, there is no more excitement than when I save money. I just get the biggest kick of saving money. And I think that it kind of starts, I mean, don't you feel that it kind of gets, it just gets in your head? Yeah, definitely. You can't get away from it. And I think that when you really realize that and you really sit down and you evaluate your life, which, you know, this stuff takes time. And we're all so busy, we don't ever spend the time to evaluate what's our vision for our, our life. Yep. And what let's design our life instead of let somebody else control our life and tell us what we're going to do. 
Yeah. And it's amazing how, you know, when you take the time to sit down and you make that plan and you start going for it, like you said, I mean, you know, it's not an easy mindset shift to do in the beginning, but the steps are simple once you've decided that that's what you want to do. And once you get your plan in place and you're just kind of following it, then it does. It's become so much fun for me too to find money to save. Like I love playing games with my money and finding all these snowflakes and everything that are just little bits of extra money I can use to put into my savings account for the next goals. And it's really exciting. And and that keeps me going. And I certainly help that it it keeps a lot of other people going too, because, you know, the more that you can motivate yourself to that end and actually enjoy the journey, I'm enjoying the journey so much now. And that's really making a huge difference. So I really want to thank you so much for your time, Myra. The book is called Down Home Money. And how can listeners get a copy? And where can they go to to read your blog and take advantage of all the resources you have to offer. Absolutely. Down Home Money has a YouTube channel. Nice. And I think that I did the YouTube channel because you need to have inspiration on a weekly basis when you start this journey. And so that's what my YouTube channel is. It's just to give inspiration. Also, Down Home Money, I have a website that you can go and all my YouTube are on there and then my blog's on there. And, you know, I just appreciate you having me here. And I think that we just got to stick together and go help people so we can make a difference in people's lives and that they can see their money differently. And I just think that when you realize what you can do with your own money, big things can happen. And I so appreciate you, Bobby, for having me on here so that you and I can make a difference today. Oh, I thank you so much for being here, Myra, and sharing with us because it's an exciting journey. And the more that we can share our successes and our and even our failures that we've learned from, the more that it helps other people. So I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Myra. Thank you. A great big sensible thank you to Myra Oliver, author of Down Home Money. Get the book and a ton of money tools at her website, downhomemoney.com. A very empowering interview. Let's get you ready to take control of your money. It's been quite a year, and I'm sure we're all ready to say goodbye to 2020. It feels like a sigh of relief to know it's coming to an end, right? But is the worst really over? While our, quote, leaders in Washington are busy fighting amongst themselves over who gets what money, much of our country is still on lockdown. Many are still out of work. A lot of people have lost their businesses. And now, to add insult to injury, a lot of the emergency programs are going to end on December 31st. What does that mean to you? Well, even though you can't go back to work, your student loan payments will no longer be deferred. The eviction moratorium will come to an end, so be prepared to pay your rent. If you've been out of work for more than 26 weeks, your unemployment is going to end. If you're still getting unemployment, you'll lose the additional $300 per week. And if you're a gig worker or freelancer who was eligible for unemployment during this special program, you're going to be cut off too. If this is scary or overwhelming for you, please keep listening. The last thing you want to do right now is run from this because reality will catch up with you. So let's face it and tackle it together. Now is the time to start planning your budget for 2021. If you've never budgeted before, it's imperative that you start now so you can stretch the dollars you do have as far as possible. If you're already a budgeter but have been depending on these programs, revise your budget now so you're prepared for the changes that are only a week and a half away. What will budgeting accomplish? It will calm your fear. Things may not be as dire as you thought once you put it on paper. And even if it is, now you can see what your money will cover and what it won't. This gives you the power to find alternatives for dealing with what you can't cover. And you can do it with a calm mind, knowing you've got a little time to make it happen, instead of waiting to the last minute, having to scramble, and inevitably making costly financial mistakes because you're desperate. So let's get started. First, make a list of all the regular income you can depend on in the new year, not including one-time gifts or tax refunds. Only count consistent regular income. Add it up and put that number to the side. Now, make a list of your mandatory expenses, starting with the basics you need to survive. This should include food, but not eating out, just the groceries you need to feed your family. Next is shelter, so add in your rent or mortgage payment. 
You'll need to keep the lights on and stay warm, so add in your electric and gas bill. If you're using the internet to look for work, add that expense, and don't forget the phone so people can reach you. Add in your transportation costs if they're mandatory, including your car payment, gasoline, and insurance. Now add all your expenses and subtract that total from your income. Did you get a positive or negative number? If the number was positive, take a minute and let this sink in. Yes, things are stressful. Yes, things are tight. But you have everything you need to survive. Count your blessings. Take a deep breath. You're going to make it. We'll dive into your next steps in just a few minutes. Now, if the number was negative, take a moment to steady yourself and don't panic. This is not the end of the world. It just means you have some more work to do. How much are you short? Write that number down and let's get to work filling the gap. Are there any services you can cut to lower your bills, like your internet speed, your phone's data plan, things like that? Review your bills and call the companies to change your plans. While you have them on the line, ask them about any assistance programs that might be available. Once that's done, write down the amount you've saved and do the math to figure out how much you're still short. Next, call your electric and gas companies to find out if they have assistance programs you can take advantage of. Write down the amount you saved and do the math to figure out how much you're still short. If the amount is small, consider cutting back on your grocery budget or changing your insurance plan if your driving habits have changed. Now that we've tightened our belts as much as possible, let's look at what other money you have to work with. Do you have any savings? How long will it fill in your gaps? If you don't have savings, do you have a retirement account? This is the last place you want to take money from to make up your day-to-day expenses, but if it's your only resource, it might be time to use it. If you're going to use it, make sure you do the math so you really know how much you need and don't take any more than that. Remember, as Myra pointed out, you're spending your future income. If you're going to need money from your retirement account, do your very best to withdraw it before the end of the year while it still falls under the CARES Act. If not, you could be facing a 10% penalty for early withdrawal. If you've exhausted all these ideas and you're still short by a considerable amount, It might be time to call your landlord or mortgage company and see if you can work something out with them until you're back on your feet. The idea here is that just because government programs are ending doesn't mean you're dead in the water. You have the power to put your own emergency measures in place and take care of yourself during this very tough time. It just takes some strategic thinking and willingness to ask for help. Notice that we haven't talked about student loans or credit card payments. That's because these should be last on your list if you're having trouble making all your ends meet. But don't misunderstand, they should still be on your list, just last. You don't want to give your last dollar to the credit card company if you can't afford food. But you need to pay them before you go out to eat or buy a new outfit. Remember, there are a lot of assistance programs out there for people in need. 211.org is a great place to start. If you don't have internet access, call 211. Either way, they can connect you with health, human, and community services in your area. Also, check out liftrocket.com. This is a resource that can provide you with something between a loan and a gift. If you missed my interview with the founders of Lift Rocket, check out the July 20th episode titled Need a Lift. If you've followed all the steps so far, you've created your financial picture. Now you can use that to create your spending plan and budget. Read my blog post, The Five-Step Budgeting Process, for instructions. If you're not in dire straits right now, but want to start budgeting or tweak your budget to be better prepared in the new year, here are some things to think about. Let's start with where we are now. Tis the season to spend, right? If you're like I was, you're in the worst part of that vicious cycle where you're kicking yourself for not planning earlier. Christmas comes once a year, same date every year, and yet you always feel unprepared. (laughs) It took me 30 years, but I finally wised up and started saving all year so I don't have to stress or go into debt in December. Trust me, saying you're going to save is not enough. Make it a bill that's included on your spending plan and create a category for it in your budget. It's done wonders for my stress level, and I save a ton of money because I don't have to pay interest. 
But how do you figure out how much you need to save? Go to sensiblechat.com and click on Budget Bites to watch my Christmas Budget Bite video for three ways to create your Christmas budget. Another thing that's top of mind right now, of course, is the emergency fund. This means different things to different people, and some have a bunch of savings funds, one for car repairs, another for medical expenses, still another for a possible job loss. You can separate these however you choose or lump them together. Just think through what is going to work for you and be willing to make changes if your first idea doesn't work. Give some thought to whether you want to save monthly for each of your different funds or focus on one at a time. Remember, you can always combine your different funds if you need to. However you're saving, always make it a bill that's included on your spending plan and have a category for it in your budget. Otherwise, that money will disappear before you know it. In addition to your planned monthly saving, always look for snowflakes to sprinkle on top. Snowflakes are extra money you can find in a bunch of different places. I find a lot of them by coming in under budget in various categories like groceries, certain bills, gasoline, things like that. If you get cash back rewards from your credit cards, those are snowflakes. But remember, they're far less than the interest you pay if you can't pay your bill in full. So make sure you're only using a credit card if you have enough money in the bank to cover that purchase. Then there are bigger snowflakes like birthday money, bonuses, tax refunds. Put it all together and you might be surprised how quickly your savings grows. If you're in debt, use the snowflakes to pay it down faster. Then focus on beefing up your savings. One more thing to think about when planning your 2021 budget, don't forget those irregular expenses. These are expenses you have to pay, but they don't come up every month, like car insurance, car registration, your Amazon Prime membership, oil changes. Do the math to turn them into monthly bills that are included on your spending plan and have a category in your budget. If you get oil changes every three months and it costs 60 bucks, save 20 bucks a month and you'll always have what you need when it's time for an oil change. I can't tell you how much these expenses used to stress me out. Now I don't even think about them because the money is always there waiting. Total stress reliever. I hope these ideas are helpful for you and I welcome any ideas you have. Share them and let's help each other get ready for 2021. Email me, bobby, B-O-B-B-I, at sensiblechat.com. And if you want help creating your budget or just want to brainstorm ideas, go to sensiblechat.com and click on the book a free call button to schedule a free budget consultation with me. And one final thought. During this holiday season, take a moment to enjoy the gifts you have that money cannot buy. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, do the math, live the life. That does it for this episode of Sensible Chat. Thanks for joining us. You'll find all the links and resources mentioned in the show notes at sensiblechat.com. That's sensible with a C. Connect with us on LinkedIn and MeWe, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. To schedule a free budget consultation, go to sensiblechat.com and click on the Book a Free Call button in the upper right-hand corner. Have a question or success story? How about a great budgeting idea? Visit sensiblechat.com for all the contact information. That's sensible with a C.